everybody welcome? So everybody's got their own pew, you guys own that? All right, there we go, good. And these guys came all the way from Marco Island, Florida just for tonight, so I am thrilled. Thank all you right. for making the effort, that's great. Um, happy Mother's Day. Anybody thrilled about that? Yes. Yes, anybody a grandma here? All right, I, I want to bless you before I, I forget or get sidetracked by anything else, but I, I want to say a blessing. Whether you are a mother, a grandmother, an aunt, um, or a significant person who cares for other people, um, this prayer is for you, okay? So let us pray. Loving God, you wrap your arms around your people, and you show your everlasting love in the same way a mother loves her children. And we are grateful for the love that you have taught us through the mothers in our lives. Our own mother who brought us into the world, the mothers of friends who have welcomed us into their homes and families, our grandmothers who took time for us, and the mothers who have helped us even though we were not their children. Bless all the mothers of this world this very day, this very weekend. May they know the fullness of love they have shared and be blessed every day of their lives. Amen. Today we are looking at Galatians, and when you get into Paul's letter writings to these various churches throughout the greater Asia and European world as we know it, um, it gets into a lot of theology and everything. So it's, it's helpful for us to understand where, where are they moving with this. And again, if you build on from last week, um, what's happening is, as the church is forming, they're not only um, sharing Jesus with uh, their own, Judaism, as you will, the Jews, they are reaching the Gentiles. And so you could say there is a conflict in the church, because this is a movement from the chosen people, where they are the ones, and they've been blessed to be a blessing, and now here's their time to bless other people and it's going beyond their scope that they had imagined before. It's a beautiful thing. It's a powerful thing. And as we grasp it and understand that the good news of Jesus Christ is for anybody and everybody, and if we live that way, our lives would be powerful because we would love people that maybe even we would exist to love now. Okay? So that's kind of the concept. Um, please stand as you're able. And we are going to sing Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone. And what I love about this reminds us about God's amazing grace, which is in the scripture text, but it also reminds us um, that some of us carry chains. Some of us are having a time with microphones today. Um, and, and it's if, if this is true for us, if our chains are gone, that God has set us free from some of those chains, we can celebrate that. Some of us may have not, and that hinders us from living life to the fullness, living life joyfully. Um, I just did the funeral of George, and George, nobody you would know, I don't think. Um, he, he passed away a month, month and a half ago, and this was at Shimon Funeral Home. He died at age 71, and he was known as a cheerful giver. He lived life, he was like a kid, a 12-year-old kid in its 71-year-old body. And he lived life joyfully, cheerfully giving, cheerfully blessing, full of hospitality, and, and people celebrated that today. As soon as I said, um, God loves a cheerful giver, George was a cheerful giver. Can I hear a yes? They said yes. Can I hear an amen? Amen. That's the kind of life that we want to live. And we can do that when God's amazing grace transform us. Let's sing it.
Oh, Lord God, we gather here this Saturday evening to give you the honor, to give you the glory, to worship you. Lord, thank you for drawing us here through the work of your Holy Spirit, that we were called here to be in this place at this time. Lord, renew our spirit, that we may be strengthened. If our spirit is low, Lord, may it be raised up. Lord, if our chains are not quite gone and we don't feel set free, Release us of those chains this evening. May the power of your Holy Spirit transform us and make us new, make us a new creation. But Lord, we come to you as your people, as your children, blessed and encouraged and sometimes discouraged. So Lord, we come to you to share what's going on in our lives, maybe the struggles, maybe the sins that keep us down, things that we have done this week or left undone, the things that we said or left unsaid that may have harmed you or others. And so, Lord, we come to you now in the silence of our hearts. Oh, Lord, you are a merciful God. You showed mercy upon Saul, who became Paul, the one who persecuted you, who harmed your followers, and you transformed his life to be the greatest missionary. Lord, you, who took a slave trader and led him to a new life of humility and faithfulness to you. Lord, you are powerful. You can do great things as you constantly do. Lord, do a mighty work in us tonight, whether it's in our heart, whether it's in our mind, whether it's in our spirit, that we be touched and know that indeed we are forgiven because of what you have done for us, Jesus, on the cross, that we may be set free by coming to you as, as sinners in need of a Savior, redeemed by you, in Jesus' name, amen. Congregation may be seated. So what the Apostle Paul did is he had multiple missionary journeys um, with a variety of people, often Barnabas and everything, but he would go visit these particular places. Sometimes it's cities, but sometimes it's a whole region. And Galatia was actually a region. Um, and so you'll see that maybe on the screen. You know, yeah, there it is. So they'll see the the... Galatia region, okay? And so what was happening is the church was forming there. And it's in its early stages. So leaders are emerging and he's equipping them. And he will be writing them letters. Um, and, and, you know, it's not email. And it's not even snail mail. I'm just, just kind of thinking how this all happened and how it got, you know, it's like, okay, here's a pony, let's, let's, let's send it, right? But he, he's very articulate. And in this particular letter, he shares about himself and the transformation that takes place and really the power of the grace of God. So let's listen to this. This is the Apostle Paul to the church in Galatia. From Galatians 1, 13 through 17 is the first part. Paul says, You have heard, no doubt, of my earlier life in Judaism. I was violently persecuting the church of God and was trying to destroy it. I advanced in Judaism beyond many among my people of the same age. For I was far more zealous for the traditions of my ancestors. But when God, who had set me apart before I was born, and called me through his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me, so that I might proclaim him among the Gentiles, 
I did not confer with any human being, nor did I go to Jerusalem to those who were already apostles before me. But I went away at once into Arabia, and afterwards I returned to Damascus. Then it skips to Galatians 2, starting with verse 11. But when Cephas, which is another name for Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he stood self-condemned. For until certain people came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But after they came, he drew back and kept himself separate for fear of the circumcision faction. Yes, there was a faction in the church. And the other Jews joined him in this hypocrisy so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not acting consistently with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile, not like a Jew, how can you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners, yet we know that a person is justified, not by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. And we have come to believe in Christ Jesus so that we may be justified by faith in Christ. And not by doing the works of the law, but because no one will be justified by the works of the law. But if in our own effort to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have, found, have been found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. But if I build up again the very things that I once tore down, then I demonstrate that I am a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law, so that I might live in, to God. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if justification comes through the law, then Christ died for nothing. Gospel of, or word of God, word of life. Praise Thanks be to God. God. Now someday, God willing, I should have had my rocking chair here. You and I will be rocking in our rocking chair, pondering how life went. We may be quite old or not so old like me. Sorry, I'm getting there. I have a bad back right now. Depending on when the Lord takes us home. And when we get near that time of passing, how will we name the blessings and the challenges of our life? Will we be confident in life after death, which I always share at a funeral like I did a few hours ago? Will we be at peace, knowing that our faith in God was strong? Will we relish in our accomplishments, the stuff we own, the vacations we took, the recognition we received? Or will there be more valuable things at this point that we will value more? Will we ponder, if we had children or grandchildren, how the faith was passed on and that you were a significant part of passing on the faith? Will you anticipate your friends and family gathered at your celebration of life service, giving thanks for your love, your Christ-like character, your faith in God, so they know that they'll see you shortly in heaven? I don't know why I threw in this line, but I thought I would. You know I'll be pastoring here another 30 years or more. So if you're in your 60s, I may be doing your funeral. Every day is a gift. I don't know how long I'll be here. but And I love Wisconsin because they love to celebrate after funerals. Yeah, it's, it's all out. But I just think of the opportunity that I have to be able to be at somebody's celebrations of life, celebration of life service and to declare their faith and the confidence of that faith and, and their faithfulness to God and, and the way God worked in their life. But my question for you today is this. Does faith in Jesus Christ matter to you? Does it really matter? Left and right, people are abandoning their faith in God. The world has enticed many with a massive array of alternative gods that people pursue 
or Satan allures them towards that take them from a life of gratitude and total allegiance to our creative and redeeming God. As I've shared multiple times before, I grew up in a household that was filled with faith. My mom was a prayer warrior. You can see her there up top with my dad. In weekly Bible study, taught Sunday school for decades, even served on the council and been through the Bethel Bible series, I'm sure, multiple times. My two sisters, Diane and Kathy, are very involved in their faith and churches. My older brother, Jerry, who is 69, left the faith altogether the day he was confirmed. Sad but true. My younger brother, Rob, told me just over a year ago that he and his wife no longer think their faith in Jesus matters. So they were both Bible camp counselors. And that's how they met and soon got married. And two, they were both in two of the best Lutheran youth groups in the Minneapolis area growing up in the 80s. We once could rely on one generation to the next that faith would be passed on. Children would learn to pray from their parents or grandparents, how to read the Bible, and conversations about faith were common. Nowadays, we are absorbed by many other things, attractions and distractions of our culture that have removed our attention on God to rather on ourselves. It's reality, folks, just naming it. Church in the U.S. today is now hybrid, both in person and online. If you can't make the service in person, you can watch it anytime. Yes, anytime you want in the convenience of your living room or on the road. Now, that's amazing, and I think that's a blessing. And I'm not knocking this because we can truly be inspired by God's Word this way. Households can dialogue about the service while it's happening because they won't disrupt the service. Is that cool? And many families even talk about the message songs and experience more as they are together in their home. So there's a lot of blessings. But what's missing? Yeah. Yeah. It's about relationships. What I saw in my brother's case, Rob, two years younger, is a true disconnect with his church. They had gone through multiple pastors their children grew up, and they truly lacked any substantial relationships. There wasn't that connection when they walked in the door and saw friends, just like at Cheers, you know, right? The busyness of life, perhaps, took them away from building friendships at church. Lack of involvement, besides attending an occasional worship service, left them wavering with the word, should we go or not go each weekend, and week after week. It would be that contemplation and become less frequent until sleeping in and hot coffee on the patio was what most fed their soul. On the other side of the coin is this. People are lonely. I could go on about the stats. People are looking for more to this life. As their heart song is singing, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. People desire to be loved, to matter, to be noticed, and simply connected, to belong to a group of people. This past Tuesday, we had a young man join us in our men's group, out of the blue, and it was great. And he even replied back how meaningful it was, how hospitable he felt the group was, how comfortable he felt. He and I are going to be doing lunch next week. So there is that yearning out there. He was bold enough to attend. Today's intimate letter written by Paul to this church plant in Galatia confronts some people in their way of thinking that is off. Did you know that Steve Jobs did not want anything to do with the concept of making an iPhone? He thought it was ridiculous. To have a computer in your pocket, what a complete waste of time. Until a few leaders confronted him, got approval, to work on the project, and in time, the iPhone and not the iPod or Mac became half their business. Jobs was stuck in his own paradigm and needed correction. That correction, that change, that changed the whole world. Paul calls out Peter, or Cephas, as Paul's letter states, mind you, after he acknowledges his the direly sinful behavior of persecuting Christians in his former life. They were at that crossroads of, 
Who can be in? Who is welcome? And what is needed or required to be grafted into the faith? Ultimately, they concluded, it is by grace through faith that we are saved. Jesus' death on the cross made us right with God. No obedience to the law, no amount of works to try to make up for all our sin. There is nothing we can do to win over God to achieve righteousness and faith. It is and only can be a free gift from God. Praise God for that. Well, Paul got it, this faith thing. But in his former life, he was off. Paul was an amazingly faith-filled, passionate believer in the one true God, but he was angry. He was zealous in a harsh way. He was going to do all he could to protect the one true faith, with no chance of it being messed up with the apparent heresy about Jesus being the Messiah, the Son of God, or at least so he thought. But then Jesus got a hold of him, blinded him, transformed his life and set him on an entirely new course in life. That Saul to Paul conversion is like the tree you see faintly there. Saul had faith and was mature like a full-leaf tree, but when his heart was made right with God, when he came to know and love Jesus, his outlook changed. Paul could see the world through a different lens, through Jesus' eyes. And despite all the suffering and persecution he would go through, he saw every opportunity as a gift from God. A gift to grow and a gift to minister in Jesus' name. And God bore much fruit through Paul. So a couple hours ago, I was doing George's funeral, and I met this lady, Roseanne. She identified me as a pastor. I don't know what gave it away. But uh, she did, and she started talking. And she had grown up in the church, in the Catholic church, and uh, she had a conversion eight years ago. And she was going on and on how much it changed her life. She's got breast cancer now, and she's battling it. But she says... "Um, I wouldn't have been able to handle this if I didn't have my faith in God that is different than it once was. And she kept going and smiling about it and telling me. Uh, she was a little righteous. I saw a little bit of Paul in her too, but, but she was faithful. And um, it, was, it was neat for her to share that story. Here's another conversion. John Newton. He wrote a hymn. Anybody know which hymn that is? Amazing Grace, the most infamous hymn. Newton was a lucrative slave trader. He captured and chained Africans, put them at the bottom of a ship where many died, and the survivors were sold for good money. But after that pursuit of fame and fortune, God got a hold of him and transformed his life, turning Newton into a humble man of God, reflecting the character of Jesus Christ. God made their relationship right solely by God's amazing grace. His sins were so many, and he said he lived with 20,000 ghosts every single day. And yet God still forgave him. Here's Newton's sharing his haunting sins before William Wilberforce, who would take on Great Britain's parliament for years until finally the law was passed where there was to be no more slavery. Check this out. I know what? The other reason I came. You told me that you live in the company of 20,000 ghosts, the ghosts of slaves. I was explaining to a child why a grown man cowers in a dark corner. I need you to tell me about them. I'm not strong enough to hear my own confession. I thought time might have changed you. It has. I'm older. Pitt has asked me to take them on. The slavers. I'm the last person you should come to for advice. I can't even say the name of any of my ships without being back on board them in my head. All I know is 20,000 slaves live with me in this little church. There's still blood on my hands. Will you help me, John? I can't help you. But do it, Wilma. Do it. 
Take them on. Throw their dirty, filthy ships out of the water. The planters, sugar barons, hold them in sugar cane, the law man of London. John Newton's transformation that he was going through, you could still see it was painful. He's still going through. But he influenced the shape of slave trading and poured into this young man who he saw hope where God could carry this through through him. Both the Apostle Paul and John Newton had been crucified with Christ. For their old selves had passed away. Christ lived in them and transformed their lives, ultimately changing the world through them. Whether you're angry at God or angry at your life, or content with sleeping in and sipping in the coffee like my brother Rob, could God be speaking to you right now in your life? proclaiming to you these words. My precious child, I love you and created you for a purpose. Follow me. There is so much more to this life than your worldly pursuits. Walk with me. I will cheer you on in the good times and carry you in the tough times. But I am with you. Your sins are gone. You have been crucified with Christ, and you no longer live. But it is Christ who lives in you. In humble confidence, in the faith that I have given you, embrace my great, amazing grace, for your sins are gone, and you have been set free. Live free in the joy of Jesus. Amen. Let's pause for a moment as we look at the slide, Footprints. If you'd like to stand, we'll join in singing a delightful version of Take My Life, again, where we're offering to God our very lives to do with God as God would as we, we live to serve him. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Shake my hands and let them move at the impulse of Thy love. Shake my feet and let them be swift and beautiful. Shake my voice and let me sing, always only for my King. Shake my lips and let them be filled with messages from me. Shake my silver and my gold, not a mind would I withhold. Shake my intellect and use every power. Take my love, and Lord, I pour 
at your feet its treasure store take myself and i will be I'd like to first thank you all for your offerings, for um, that continue to support the ministries here at St. Olaf, that we may minister God's word in our community. Let us now confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, he was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Alive in the risen Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit, we bring our prayers before God who promises to hear us and answer in steadfast love. Loving God, you call us to bear good fruit. Strengthen the bonds among all Christian churches. And today we pray for the Moravian Church, giving thanks for the life and witness of Nicholas Ludwig von Zinzendorf, who is a renewer of the church and hymn writer. Hear us, O God. Your, Your mercy, mercy is, is great. great. Creating God, the whole earth praises you. The spring air and the green hills sing for joy. Fill the earth with your love so that with all the creatures of land, sea, and sky, we may join together in praise to you. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Faithful Savior, you conquer the world not with weapons, but with your undying love. Plant your words in the hearts of the nation's leaders and give them your spirit so that all people of the world may live in peace. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Caring healer, you forget no one and accompany the lonely. Be present with those who are sick or suffering especially those friends and family listed on our screen that we read together. Noah, Noah Linda, Linda Frederick, Frederick, Harriet, Harriet Jenna, Jenna Kathy, Kathy L. L, and Mike. Also for those serving in the military around the globe and those who have returned home. Bring them healing and renewed health. Hear us, O God. Your, Your mercy, mercy is great. great. Provide for those needing homes or medical care and help us to offer life-changing responses to the needs in our own community. And especially we pray for our ministries with All People's Church and Family Promise. Hear us, O God. Your, Your mercy, mercy is great. great. Gracious God, as a mother comforts her child, you comfort I comfort us. Bless mothers and mothering people in our lives. Comfort those who miss their mothers and mothers who grieve 
those who grieve because they cannot be mothers, and those who have never known a loving mother. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Gentle Redeemer, all who die in you abide in your presence forever. We remember with thanksgiving those persons in our lives who shared your love with us and those they encountered daily. Keep us united with them in your lasting love. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. In the hope of new life in Christ, we raise our prayers to you, trusting in your never-ending goodness and mercy, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Two thousand years ago, Jesus gave a command to his disciples soon to be sent out as apostles. And this was on a Thursday evening, known as Monday Thursday, again a command to serve and love one another but also to have this meal together. And when we gather, we are reminded what Jesus has done for us, again, that we are saved by grace. And so in that night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you, shed for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Let us join in the prayer he taught his followers to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. So there is a thin film on top. You can, well, you can take off your mask, take off the thin film, and this is the body of Christ given for you. And the blood of Christ shed for you. The body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. All right, ministry moments. Let me see what I've got here. Oh, I just found out there's like two crews that are going to be put, coming together and making cinnamon rolls. We just got to figure out the date. We got some youth that are going to do this. All right. You can only imagine more sugar in the recipe, right? Um, but I'm getting excited to do this. Now, I've also been told that some businesses will not receive gifts. I had not heard that. Um, so hopefully we can sneak in as many as possible and just say, hey, we want to just have a coffee break. Is that okay? And if they take the mug, great. If they don't, okay, well, I think they can eat a cinnamon roll. I don't know. So that's our hope, just so you know. Um, I do have the Chosen video series. Um, We've already had a couple people go through it. If there is anybody who would like to watch it, this is last year's, so we're already in this year's, and I think the fourth one for this year is coming out on May 11th, if I'm told right. Um, So check that out. Again, this gives you such perspective on Jesus. It is such a delight. Some of it might be a little slow going for you at first, but again, it could be meditative where you really reflect and think, what is this Jesus like? So that is available. Please stand as you choose, and like last week, that theme of grace comes into the scripture, so we're singing this again, your grace is enough. Great is your faithfulness, O God. So with the sinner's heart, you lead us. 
Your grace is enough for 